we really have terrific customer service. That's one of the really big things about Plymouth Spring. We have our, our I think our secret ingredient is the best customer service in the industry. And I'll get to that in a moment. A quick interruption to mind you to like, subscribe, and rate this podcast so we can get your feedback and know how to make it better. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Made in America podcast. I am really looking forward to this week's episode. I'm with Richard Rubenstein, who has done so much in and for the state of Connecticut, starting at Aetna uh, and then going on to manufacturing. Richard, thank you so much for coming on today. Glad to be here. Well, listen, it is the Made in America podcast, Richard. So we start off with the same two questions. What do you make and why do you make it? Well, we make a lot of different things for our customers. I brought a few of them just to show you um, our Name business is springs, where we make all types of springs. This happens to be where an automotive spring, and this is for a military spring where we make it goes into a fuse. Um, we also make wire forms, which are little pieces of wire which we shape into virtually anything you can use them for. Our biggest customer makes antennas for uh, his home security device, and that's the Honeywell Corporation. But our actually our biggest business is stampings. Hmm. And this is an example of a stamping. This is uh, for our largest customer. It goes into a, an electrical safety switch. Uh, we also make this part goes to another large conglomerate, and it's used in a measuring device. It's been on the market for about 50 years. Huh. So it's a very diversified customer base and a very diversified product line. That's great. Listen, I mean, it's an amazing company, been around for a long time, and you've been with it and made it very successful over that period of time. Before we really get into Plymouth Spring and all those details, let's kind of go back to the beginning because you've got really a very interesting uh, story in history. I think the audience would learn a lot from it, starting in insurance, uh, mergers and acquisitions, into manufacturing, dabbled a little, little bit of real estate, some different manufacturing businesses along the way, uh, and a great contributor to the community. So we've got a lot to cover um, but let's just maybe start at the beginning. You know, how did you get into manufacturing? It's an interesting story. It's uh, something I never expected to do. Uh, I went to uh, the University of Pennsylvania to the Wharton School. I was going to be a banker or um, a lawyer. I uh, got accepted to Penn Law after um, I finished my senior year at Penn. But unfortunately, the Vietnam War came along and I was in the reserves and I ended up spending the summer of my graduation in the Army. And when I got out of the army, it was the last day of the summer, and I came home. We'd been married a year with my wife, and I said to her, I'm going to take a year off. I'm not going to go back to Penn right now, take a year. She looked me right in the eye and said, if you don't go back to law school now, you'll never go. And I looked her right back and said, you're wrong. <laughs> and as usual, she was right. <laughs> And I never became a lawyer. And the truth is, I only miss it once every five years for a day. Uh, but uh, the career has worked out pretty well. Uh, I went to work for Aetna Life and Casualty. Uh, they interviewed me and they offered me a job running two punch card lines in the basement. And I said, uh, no, I don't think so. I said, well, you've had two years of high school. I said, no, I had a little bit more than that. So I said, I want to be in mergers and acquisitions. And they said, we don't have an opening. They called the department. They had an opening. And I spent two years there. It was really exciting. Wait, uh, hold on one second. So you went to Aetna. You interviewed for a punch card. No, I interviewed for a finance job, but the guy sent me to the punch card department. Okay. So you interviewed for a finance job. He's like, they don't just say, I mean, because like nowadays, right, you apply for a job. If that job's not available, they just like send you packing. But no, in these totally days, different then. in these days, if they didn't have that, they would see if there was something else. That's right. And then you got the something else and you said, no, no, I'm sorry. I appreciate the something else, but I don't want to work here. I want to go somewhere else. And someone still made a call to see if that was available. That's correct. And it was. Wow. Yeah, it was, a a, it was the luckiest call of my life. Let's yeah. put it that way. I spent two years. Uh, they had uh, five people in the department. We managed a billion dollars worth of assets. And in 1970, that was a lot of money. Yes, sir. We, of um, my specialty was turnarounds. Uh, I had a real important job when one day my boss came to me and said, uh, the chairman of the company wants you to rescue the Aetna drival trainer, which was the thing you would sit in. And they put a projection on the screen and kids would learn how to drive. This was something Aetna sponsored, but the manufacturer went out of business. So he said, go rescue the company. And I said, how do I do that? He said, go figure it out. 
And uh, six months later, we had them rescued. And uh, I did that all myself. It was really fascinating. But I learned a lot where about was turnarounds. The, where was that business? Excuse me? Where was the business? Business was in New York. Okay. And it went bankrupt. The guy was, uh, he had a great business, but he couldn't make enough money. And we ended up selling it to another company. And they took over the driver trainer. No kidding. And then one day, about two years into this, I got a call from my father. My father was in scrap metal. That was his uh, occupation. He had a big customer called Scoville Manufacturing in Waterbury, Connecticut. And he said, uh, Scoville wants to get rid of its foundry operation in Watertown. And they've offered it to us on really good terms. He says, how would you and your brother like to run it? I said, well, I don't know anything about it. He says, okay, well, how, how about starting tomorrow? <laughs> I said, tomorrow? He said, yeah. He said, you'll figure it out. So uh, I went down to uh, Watertown. And sure enough, uh, I started a couple of days later. First thing that happened is they went on strike because they were told that we were closing the business, which we weren't. We spent six years there. And that's where I learned really about turnarounds. And what we did was we put in a lot of new equipment and we bought our competitors in the plumbing business. And this is what we made. We made brass ball cocks for plumbing. And uh, you'll see that this is a casting made in a foundry. Mm -hmm. This is a casting and this is a copper tubing that we bought. And it was a really good business at the time. It was a niche. Uh, plastic had taken over most of the market, but people wanted brass. And we were in that business for six years. And when I left that business, it was a really very good business. But at the time, we were, had another opportunity. Uh, we got a call. Uh, my father got a call from Scoville again and said, okay, so you bought our foundry. How would you like to buy the rest of it? And we got 3,500 employees in Waterbury. And we we're in the brass mill, which he had been supplying the scrap for for years. And we have a manufacturing business, and we'd like to sell it to you. Now, this is the equivalent of the very tiny ant swallowing the enormous elephant. And my father, without hesitating, said, sure. And nine months later, after being on the front page of the Waterbury newspaper and the Hartford Current every single day, every single day, we ended up doing the deal. And uh, it was a lot of smoke and mirrors. Uh, the closing uh, occupied four large rooms with piles of paper on every single desk and 100 lawyers. But it closed, we think. Yeah. Never know for sure. <laughs> uh, about a year later, uh, they asked me to come down and um, see if there was something I wanted to do there. Who was running it? It was run by my father and by some of his associates. Plus, we had a whole staff of people that came with it. It was 3,500 employees. And Scoville wanted out of the business. They basically uh, wanted to be in other types of manufacturing. They owned Hamilton Beach. They owned Dritz. And they owned a whole bunch of other operations, but they wanted out of this business. So I went down there and they gave me a tour. The tour took four days. It was um, 114 buildings. Uh, it was uh, 114 several hundred, uh, buildings? Several hundred acres of property in downtown Waterbury. And finally, they took me to an operation. What here. year is this? This is in downtown Waterbury. No, what year? Oh, uh, this was 1978. Okay. We bought it at the uh, middle of 76. And it was just the, this was the week before the big storm that we had to close down the state because mm -hmm. my first day of work was at home because uh, I couldn't go anywhere. So they took me through and they um, had a Ford shop um, and they said that lost money. Ford shop is where you put a bar of hot steel into a press and you slam the press down and it makes a forging okay. and forgings are very expensive. And by the way, this is a forging. That's an aqualung valve. This head of this guy. Mm -hmm. um, it's made for porosity. So you want to be sure that there are no leaks and an aqualung valve. You obviously can't have any leaks, mm -hmm. but expensive, but the operation was losing money. And I said, is there any way to turn it around? They said, impossible. So I said, okay, I'd like that. <laughs> And uh, six months later, uh, we had it turned around. There was a lot of secrets to how it happened, but we did it. And they offered me the job of running the entire division at 32 years old. That was 2,500 employees. Jeez. And I said, yes. In our family, we always like to leap first and look later. <laughs> and um, I ended up being there for nine years. Um, 
our operation made a lot of money. We turned it around. We made uh, we were a hundred million dollar operation. Uh, we made twenty four hundred different products, including the penny blank. Uh, we the little guy here has a little penny around him. Mm -hmm. We made the blanks for the government. Okay, and sent them off to the mint. And lots of other automotive products. Uh, we made hypodermic needles. We had all kinds of stuff. But we were very big in automotive. That was our big claim to fame. And Ford and GM were our major customers. But after nine years, I left that business. And I went off on my own and decided that I wanted to do something for me. So I ended up uh, doing three things. Uh, one, uh, I started a bank. Uh, I had been a director of a community bank, and I thought, gee, wouldn't it be nice if West Hartford had a community bank? We didn't have one. And in those days, 1986, that was the right thing to do, to have a community bank. And I uh, started it, and uh, we were in business for uh, 13 years and sold to Webster Bank at the end. Uh, it was a good business, but we were hit by the real estate depression of 1990, the colonial realty fiasco and things of that sort. Still, we made it through. We did well. And when we sold the bank, we were very proud of what we had created. The second thing I did was I got in the record storage business, which is where you take boxes of records and you put them on the highest building you can find and you put them on shelves. I'll make a long story short. We were in that business six months. Uh, we had 10,000 boxes. Our uh, biggest competitor had 31 million. And uh, we had dinner with them one day, and my father said, we'll buy you or you buy us. They bought us. And uh, without going through the entire transaction, I will tell you, it was probably the best deal I ever did in my life. It was, uh, I had a partner, Gerard Barrio Jr., great guy. At that time, he was in the moving and storage business, and together, we did a very good deal for them and for us. Everybody was very happy. And the last thing I did was, uh, we had bought Plymouth Spring in 1982 when they were a supplier to this company. And they came to us and to said- To Scoville. Scoville. Well, not well, to Century Brass. Got it. But that's right, the Scoville manufacturing business. And they came to us and said, uh, look, we're I'm retiring in four weeks, and I'm real sorry, but you guys have been great. And we said, wait, uh, you're, you're OEM to 100 Ford Motor Company parts, and it takes a year for Ford to allow a new supplier- you can't do that. He said, okay, I can't do it. I am though. I'll be gone in four weeks. So a group of us got together and privately we bought the business and that was 1982. And I didn't go there until 1989. So and in 1989, I went there because the partners asked me to close it. It was losing about uh, $50,000 a year and they weren't doing very well. So I went and I looked around, there was money all over the walls, so to speak. The management had a few things to be desired and uh, basically bought the partners out and started buying spring companies. And that's how I got into business. There's so much to uh, unpack there, uh, Richard, but just listen, I get to run the show, so I get to ask some stuff that I'm just Absolutely. curious about. You know, it just seems so amazing to say, my hometown could use a bank. I should start a bank. I, I just, how does that even work? Because I'd been a director of a community bank. And in those days, it was a good thing to be a community bank. And in those days, directors were encouraged to borrow from the bank. Today, that's an absolute no-no. You go to jail for that. But in those days, the banking commissioner encouraged the directors to borrow. So it was always good to have a hometown bank. Um, unfortunately, what we discovered was that $100 million in deposits, it wasn't big enough for the technology. And as technology grew, we discovered, as did all the other small banks, that in order to survive, they had to merge or they had to sell because they couldn't afford all the computerization that was coming, all the regulations. And so reluctantly, we sold our bank to another bank. But it was a good run while we were at it. It's amazing. And we offered terrific service. That was our big thing. Great service. Yeah, right in West Hartford Center. It was right like first, Center. first National Bank of West Hartford. First Bank of West Hartford. First Bank of West Hartford. That's good. Uh, that's amazing. So we just go to the bank commissioner and you just say, hey, we want to charter a bank and then boom. And, and give them $8 million. Okay. Well, <laughs> you have you to go. raise that. But right yes, that. essentially that's it. They check to be sure you're not with the mafia or something else. And if, you're, if your background's okay, you have the right lawyer and you uh, 
answer the questions correctly and you have the right capital, they'll give you a charter. Now, that was in 1986. I don't know what they'll do today. And then but, what, the people just come and give you money and then that's how that works and mm -hmm. then you get deposits and then... Mm -hmm. We had about uh, like most 500 things. shareholders no that kidding. subscribed to it. And we subscribed the $8 million in eight weeks. The other thing I wanted, which you sort of glanced over, but it feels fundamental to the success of this story, you know, and, and it's just, it's just so fascinating how much, you know, this manufacturing show. And so we're going to focus on that and how much you've been in manufacturing and you know the turnarounds, which I want to talk about, but, you know, uh, you know, stampings, forgings, uh, brass and waterbury. I mean, talk about iconic uh, springs, also iconic uh, in Connecticut automotive. I mean, there's just so much there. And a lot of this seems to me that it really hinges a lot on well, a family background, which we'll certainly get to that but also to that turn of fate of going into Aetna and learning about kind of M&A and business transaction. And a lot of that seems fundamental to what you did later. Is that a fair assessment? I think partially. I, I certainly, the background that I had from Penn and the background I had from Aetna was, was key. But I'm different than most of the people you have on your podcast. When you interview people, they tell you how they were always looking for a successful business. They wanted something that they could take the chart out and show <laughs> how good it was. We didn't operate that way. When I went into Plymouth Spring and we started buying companies, we didn't look for successes. We looked for failures. We bought garbage. We bought companies that had estate issues, had fights with among the owners, had losing customers. There were all kinds of reasons why these companies were failing. And if we hadn't bought them, they would have gone into bankruptcy and the owners would have got nothing. So we offered a rather unique operation. We paid them a royalty based upon future sales. We gave them an employment contract. We took their people, those that were employable, that was. And we took their customers. And so we assembled eight lousy companies into a very successful business today. And it has worked out extremely well. And if I can give you one example of how yeah, that happened. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, we bought a company called Bristol Spring that was located in Plainville, Connecticut, of course. <laughs> Just like Plymouth Spring is not in Plymouth, Plymouth. but in Bristol. Right. Um, and this company had one very large customer, very large. And the whole deal was contingent upon keeping that customer. And when we went to the customer, they said to us, look, we've got 12,000 vendors and the company you're buying is 11999 on the list. There must be somebody worse, but we don't know who it is. But you're, you're, the company you're buying is the worst company we deal with. We don't like the people involved with it. We don't like the product. On and on and on. So we invited them to come visit us. And we spent three days with these people. And in the end, they said, okay, here are seven conditions. If you meet all those conditions, we'll let you keep the business for at least a year. Four years later, I was invited to their corporate headquarters where I got an award for being one of their top 10 vendors. So we felt really good about that. And um, success is all about taking these opportunities and turning them into gold. Well, I mean, listen, Midas touch over there, Richard. Midas touch, that's uh, that's for sure. And I, one, I wanted, this is so much on the turnarounds, I want to ask you just one more thing on the Edna sure. component. As I read about sort of what you were doing at Aetna, which is effectively was sort of taking insurance proceeds. And then they were, I guess what they were doing, which you helped with was investing in buying businesses and using the profits of those businesses to generate profits That's for the right. business. Sort of reminds me of like kind of the Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway approach that you read about all the time, right? I mean, sort of that similar yeah, they, concept. They had, a, uh, they had several ways of investing their money. They had uh, what they called a bond portfolio, private bonds, they had common stocks, of course, and they had this operation that was their corporate development operation. And they owned a hotel chain. They owned a, uh, a business lender um, that was located in East Hartford. Uh, they owned a real estate operation that was a partnership with Alcoa and several other ventures. And um, in the end, they finally decided long after I left that that wasn't for them. And they slowly liquidated some of those and they bought other companies. But that was their idea, was to take their cash, and they had a lot of cash, mm -hmm. a lot of cash, and they invested in these opportunities. And they don't do, does, does Aetna or just generally insurance companies still do that? What they do, do some, but I think they're more oriented toward equities and standard investments. And when they do alternative investments, normally they do it through some kind of uh, partnership with somebody else. So Most of these companies no longer do this directly. 
Duh. except Berkshire Hathaway, which is the exception. Sure. Seems like they figured out a way to make it work, but that's right. interesting. Um, all right. Well, let's get off that and let's just talk about the turnarounds because it's funny, you know, um, you know, a friend of mine uh, who I respect quite a bit talks about the three types of businesses that you can buy, right? The pristine, you know, he calls it the uh, bring your toothbrush business, right? It's everything's ready to go. You come in, the floors are clean, the business is running. Customer, you pay a premium, uh, but in theory, right? It, I've it's never a, bought one of those. Clearly, I, uh, wait till I get to your your purchases. <laughs> then there's the you know, then there's the the, the sort of fixer upper, right? And uh, if you think of like a house, and there's different versions of fixer uppers. Some a little more fixing than others, mm-hmm. but you know, some improvement. And, and those could be relatively, you know, good businesses to buy because you can get a bit of a discount. And if you've got the the gumption and the process and the wherewithal behind it, you know, with a, with a bit of work within 12 to 18 months, you can, you know, increase the the returns and, and pretty good and make it part of the bigger business. And, and that's one way to do it. And then there's, um, you know, what he would call the dilapidated business, the one that um, is headed towards bankruptcy, customer relationships are frayed, the employees are, at least in large portion or in some portion, questionable, uh, possibly management is questionable, um, and uh, and and they're headed in the, the total wrong direction. You have made a successful life out of buying not a dilapidated business, but essentially a portfolio of dilapidated businesses and somehow making other people, I, I, garbage is the word that's coming to mind, but other people's inability to execute business trash in some sense and turning it into gold. Uh, how? Well, first of all, not only gold for us, but for the owners. I, I think it's clear that the deals we did were not just for the benefit of Plymouth Spring. We made a lot of money for the people who had these predicaments. So it is not that we took advantage of them. In fact, um, they made a lot of money and they were to the, to a fault. They were all very thankful for what we did. Yes. And actually I, I, that's an amazing point. And I do want to just, because I, maybe I didn't properly educate on that. Cause I think this is what I find so amazing. This isn't sort of coming in and the vulture capitalism where you come in, Absolutely. make a steal, uh, liquidate the business, sell the property, sell the equipment, you know, raid the, um, pension fund that, that is not, none you of know, that. none of that. You took this stuff, which frankly, without your help, was headed to disaster, auction bankruptcy, block. yeah, which and probably that type of liquidation, right. the loss of jobs, the damage to the community, and so forth. And you turned turned it around to the benefit of the former owners, which they couldn't have done before, to the benefit of the employees to keep them and give their careers and their family to maintain for the community, the tax base. And then instead of having dilapidated old buildings, which we've seen other businesses turn into, I mean, you were able to turn around a business, not only to make profit for the people that got into it, but for all the stakeholders and community before that, where we are in today's age, where everyone talks about all the stakeholders in an era of shareholder supremacy, you did this. I mean, how? Well, the first thing was we had the expertise in the industry. Without the expertise in the industry, we would have been like everybody else trying to figure out what to do. Secondly, we only concerned ourselves with the gross profit. We didn't care why the business was losing money as long as the gross profit of what they were doing was high enough because we only had to worry about our gross profit levels, not theirs. So when we would buy a typical operation, we would uh, take the customers over, the ones that were left. And unfortunately, in many cases, they were leaving by the day. We take the customers over that were left. We really have terrific customer service. That's one of the really big things about Plymouth Spring. We have, our, our, I think our secret ingredient is the best customer service in the industry. And I'll get to that in a moment. So we... Uh, basically would take the employees, take the equipment that such as it was, and we had the expertise to run it. That made a huge difference. It made a huge difference also to the customers because the customers, like the one I talked about, were all ready to leave because of what was happening and they stayed. So we built our business that way. Now we also built it by uh, the normal way, by using a sales force and by going out and getting business. But we have customers today that we don't even know we have. They still come out of the woodwork Oh, I did business with so and so 15 years ago. I need to reorder. Uh, we can't believe it. And some of these uh, customers are substantial and some of their orders are substantial. So it's been a really good run for us. But the secret is know your business and know what you're doing. 
and and all of our computations, you know, I used to joke that we did them all in the back of an envelope because truthfully, the normal way of evaluating a business doesn't work for these businesses. You have to evaluate how it will look for you in your circumstances, not how it looks for them. Yeah, how to basically put your spin on it and Correct. get your results, not get their results. Clearly, their results aren't aren't making it happen. So it's really so you know you say no the business, but in a number of these stories, you jumped in and didn't seem like you did know the business. You know you you know. Well, at the beginning, that's true. At the beginning, when I got into the foundry business, I knew zero, zero about manufacturing. Uh, but of course, I was kind of pushed, so I was. Um, I didn't know where I was going to land. Uh, my father uh, is a great guy, was a great guy, and but his background in manufacturing was limited. He was a, a trader. He would buy metal in California and sell it in Connecticut in 15 seconds, and his span of attention was uh, highly limited. Uh, but um, we had a friend of his that came in to help us, someone we hired, and he gave us a lot of expertise. Our customers were very helpful, and Scoville was very helpful. They were terrific. They uh, sent over people. They uh, they acted as if we were um, one of their children, and they gave us a lot of expertise, and that's because of the long relationship that we had had with them through um, other business. So for so I'm going to take a little tangent and come back, but mm -hmm. for, for people that are out there, right, who maybe are seeing and finally catching on to the fact that manufacturing is an exciting place to it's work. It's an exciting place. An exciting place to be. It's high tech. There's great careers, great business opportunities. Um, if someone's out there thinking about that and thinking, I don't, you know, how would I get started? I've never been in it. I don't know how to learn it. You know, I know it's a number of years back, but how did you learn it? How did you come in into thrust into a role that was brand new, youngster, probably managing people who were many years your senior many years who yes. who and i know you know especially some of the old timers right they can be you know pretty particular and we had a union on top of it which made it even tougher and there you go on top of that so i mean what do you have to say to people out there who are thinking about getting in how, how did you do it how, how first of all you keep your eyes open mm -hmm. that's the first thing a uh, two um you obviously have to have advice um i think that uh, accountants and lawyers can be helpful but I found accountants and lawyers have screwed up more deals than they've made happen. So your Amen. advisors are great to have, but be careful of them. Mm -hmm. It's always good to have someone as a partner who knows something about how to run a business. Um, and I think that is a key element. But entrepreneurs take risk. Mm -hmm. And you have to measure how much risk you're willing to take, what's your appetite for risk, what's your downside, and what's your upside. Uh, when I got into the manufacturing business, I literally was pushed. It was a cliff. And, you know, if I, if we uh, hit the bottom, well, that was it. But we spent 18-hour days. I spent uh, many weekends working, uh, travel all over the country selling our product. Uh, we did, we spent a lot of time. This is not an easy way to do business. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. But by the second year, I was pretty well versed in what was going on. Uh, my brother ran the manufacturing end of it. I ran the sales and business end of it. And uh, we made a good team. And we had a lot of good opportunities. Uh, buying competitors was something we never thought of when we got into it. But it became clear to us that there were other people struggling. So why not? And we had good opportunities and we bought them. And then because we had the base, we eliminated all the extras and simply sold their products and made their products. So, I mean, listen, hard work, being opening to learn, using mentors, Absolutely. Uh, being careful for lawyers and accountants. Listen, just as a side note on that, you know, lawyers and accountants are risk averse generally by nature. Always. Their job is to reduce risk. They always want to reduce their side's risk to zero. If your side risk is zero, the other guy's risk is 100% or something right. in that balance. Um, and so we want to get to a place that works. Uh, and, you know, I heard you sort of say, roll up your sleeves and get in it. You, have you didn't to. sit in the office and be like, go sell this, go sell that. You're out there selling. If you want that kind of job, there are lots of nine to five jobs available. Uh, but um, when you're in business for yourself, it's all your risk. You know, you have to make payroll every week. There's nobody there standing behind you saying, well, if you don't have enough money this week, we'll just take it out of some other place. It's all on you. And that's good and bad. Sometimes you have sleepless nights 
and sometimes uh, you don't, but uh, you look at the success you have and you feel great about it. We built on the success. It took a couple of years for that company to really start making money. But when I left that company, which was called Wilshire Industries, it was doing extremely well. I was very proud of what we had done there. Yeah, listen, you got to be able to be focused right on the horizon. Absolutely. If you start off in the situation and you want to be happy in a day, a week, an hour, you know, you're in for a long ride. But it must be rewarding, Richard, to look back on all these successes and how many lives you've touched for a positive way. Yeah, I, I tell you that I, I have enjoyed being in the business. But I also, at the beginning, I also made another commitment. And that was I didn't want to devote all my time to doing business. So there were some other things in my life that were equally as important. And so I sent, spent enough time doing those other things. And, you know, there's an old saying that if you want something done, ask a busy person. Well, it's true. Mm -hmm. uh, there were many times I didn't have time to do things, but I did it anyway. Found the time. Sometimes it was 18-hour days. Sometimes it was weekends, whatever it took. But I wanted to have more than just a business career because you're remembered not just for what you do in business, but what you do in life. Mm -hmm. And that's important to me. Yeah, 100%. And I've got a lot to get into on that front because I think, you know, in many ways, Richard, you set, you set a great example for people to follow. And I think, um, well, we're going to get to that. I want to go right back to business for a second because not only did you buy a business that was struggling and make it work, but you fixed that business mm -hmm. in part by buying other struggling businesses. So maybe first let's educate the audience on what I mean by that. How did that work exactly um, to do to, to do that, take that approach? Um, and, and yeah, let me explain that. Well, there's two things to remember. One, I tried when we would buy extra businesses, I tried to keep within our knitting. In other words, we knew our industry. We tried not to go too far outside the industry. And so we stuck to what we knew. Meaning? We, you, we, knew, the, we knew the manufacturing business. We knew how to make springs, how to make stampings. And so we tried to keep to that general realm. We we strayed a little bit, but not too much. So that was one thing we did. We wanted to be sure we knew what we were getting into. Stay in your lane, roughly. Stay in our lane, absolutely. Um, I think that the secret to all of this is that uh, we would take a business. First of all, many of them came, they came in different ways. Uh, one business came in by a letter from an accountant <laughs> saying, you want to buy it. Another really funny story, um, there was a guy that we did business with in downtown Bristol. And I called him up one day and I uh, asked him to pay a bill. We did some work for him. And uh, he said, okay. And then uh, uh, five minutes later, he called me back and said, by the way, you want to buy my business? <laughs> said, I had some people here. I couldn't talk. He said, you want to buy our business? I said, sure. And about well, six weeks later, we bought his business. Um, others came in because uh, we had one was an 85-year-old man. His son, who was 60, passed away. Unfortunately, a very sad story. The man had to come back. And um, an hour later, he called us and said, do you want to buy my business? There so there we were. So all kinds of different ways. Uh, but it turned out to be, I think, um, good opportunities for us. We also looked at a number that we didn't buy, uh, either because uh, the price was too high or because it just didn't fit. So it, you kept, have to be so selective had, as well. You had, you, had, you had price discipline? Yes. And you had industry and fit discipline? Absolutely right. And that's a that's a that's a hard thing to do, um, but it's a it's an important one. Plus, we had the other ingredient for us was good management. We had good management and have good management. If you don't have good management, you're just piling one problem on top of another. Right. So we have uh, at Plymouth Spring. I have a um, gentleman who runs the business day to day, the manufacturing and the uh, financial end of it. I have an excellent controller. I have a uh, vice president of sales and a whole staff beneath them and a whole bunch of foremen who work, who uh, oversee our business. That's the only way that you can take some of these operations and meld them in. Uh, in fact, yesterday we were talking about buying another company in California. So we're, you know, we're still at it. Yeah, you are still at it. Yeah, listen, you know, it reminds me of sort of the, the saying here sometimes, right? A, a drowning a drowning person can't save another drowning person. You're not going to, you know, piling, piling, you know, more Pull dysfunction. <laughs> yeah, more dysfunction on top of other dysfunction right. isn't going to get it done. So, but most of the businesses you bought were also struggling, right? They were all struggling. Without exception. Without exception. 
So I some, never, I've never bought a business that I walked into and said, gee, I can go sleep now. <laughs> never happened. Every one of them required a lot of work. But once the work was done, it was fairly simple at that point. We had a lot of upfront work. But once you have dismantled a business or you've made the arrangement, whatever you've done, and you've got it into your framework, well, then it works like everything else. So- <laughs> Were you consolidating real estate, moving the business? Were you mostly we moved, moving we the moved customer? all the businesses to our factory. Uh, the owners were able to sell the real estate. They got some good prices for it. Uh, the employees, we took everybody who wanted to be employed. But most of the people, frankly, um, didn't want to stay for one reason or another. They were either old, they wanted to retire, or they didn't like the industry or whatever, which was part of the reason why these businesses were having all the problems. Right. They, uh, you're struggling with the people. And so, right. uh, so you got there. So, you know, you were, you, we had sort of touched on the fact that, well, I mean, before I go do this, you look back on the way you bought these businesses. I mean, six weeks back of an envelope, it's been very successful, but anything you would have done differently? Larger envelope. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think that we, I, I, I can't point to any one of them that was a failure. Uh, they were all successful. And this goes way back to the foundry days. Uh, no, all the businesses were successful. The only thing I would have done differently is when I was running this manufacturing business in downtown Waterbury, I tried very hard to get it out of the complex. That is to spin it off. We were large enough at the time to go on the New York Stock Exchange, that business alone. Uh, but for many legal and financial reasons, it wasn't possible. That's probably the only thing in my career that I would have done significantly different. You wanted to spin that out because that, wanted to spin that, it biz, out. that was, that was a, that was a swimmer that got dragged down by, a, by a drowning compatriot yes. basically. Yeah. And nothing we could do about it. I mean, this business made a great deal of money, but it had a partner that wasn't doing well. Why couldn't you extricate? Uh, when we bought the business, there was a pension plan that was commingled. So to buy the, to, in order to you would have to pay down the pension, pay down the pension plan, and you have to pay the all the extra money that was owed on the pension plan. Plus, the physical plant was interchanged. It was with 114 buildings, but many of them were commingled. Um, it, it was impossible. We tried. We really did try, but it it just didn't work. And so, what ended up happening to that business? The business was sold off. I mean, the business was um, um, the union. The union decided they wanted more money. They struck the company. And at that point, the company decided that that was it. Wasn't going to go any further. General Products, the operation I ran was sold off in bits and pieces because it was a very profitable, very successful. And the brass mill uh, was shipped to Korea. A sad story there. But uh, I was but I was gone. You were long that, gone. I yeah, was yeah, gone. Yeah, you, you I, moved on. I, there was nothing more I could do. I mean, I made all the money I could make for them. There's nothing more I could do. Yeah, listen, you can't. Sometimes you get into situations, it's not your thing. But let's kind of flip because I think, you know, I talked about or alluded to the fact that, you know, in the businesses that you worked in, it wasn't it wasn't just about your profits, but you you took care of the employees, the former owners. And I think that that's something that you kind of see in the in the other part of your life. And I think, you know, your, the part of your life we talked about for business, that sort of started on a lucky, uh, not lucky, but a, a unique twist of fate with a couple of phone well, calls. Well, no, lucky, and, lucky, lucky would be, uh, my wife thinks it's lucky. Yeah, well, there you go. Um, <laughs> I think it's lucky. <laughs> uh, listen, exa exactly right. You know, twist, small twists of fate, um, you know, can, can make big waves down the line. But your personal life kind of had a small a twist of fate that 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 became big and it's a great story and maybe you could share that with our audience so i was brought up in west hartford my parents were uh, very involved in the jewish community my father was in the second world war fought in the third army liberated a concentration camp came back from the war part of the greatest generation of course but uh was very affected by what he saw and decided to help the jewish people he wasn't religious i think he set foot in the synagogue 10 times in his life but he was president of a number of major charities in Hartford, uh, including the Hartford Jewish Federation, the Hebrew Home, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Spent a lot of time raising and giving money. But uh, their one regret was their son, me, uh, wasn't really interested. And when I went to Penn, didn't really excite me. You know, I was I knew I was Jewish, but it didn't mean anything to me. In the summer of uh, my uh, freshman and sophomore year, which uh, was um, was in the uh, 1966, uh, I was offered a trip to Europe because a fellow that my parents knew 
was head of an operation called the Joint Distribution Committee, a large charity worldwide that took care of Jews all over the world, rescue and relief, especially during and after the Second World War. And he wanted his nephew to see the operations, so he put together this trip for six college students and his nephew, and we spent 10 weeks. I was sold to me as a trip to Europe, free trip to Europe. That's how they sold it. It started in Geneva. We went to Morocco for a week. Again, see all their operations. They were helping 250,000 Moroccan Jews. Mm -hmm. Then to France, Marseille, Paris, the French Riviera, into Italy, and then by boat to Haifa, two and a half weeks in Haifa, seeing again all the operations in, Haifa, in Israel. At that time, they ran uh, an operation called Malben, which is an old people's home, whole series of them. And then to Vienna, and then home, back to, back to Geneva and home. When we got to Vienna, I had really by that time become indoctrinated, really indoctrinated. I was, I felt my whole life had changed, that I saw the value of what they were doing, and I felt that I had to do something to help the Jewish people. I just, just changed my life. So I went to Mauthausen, which was a concentration camp, a terrible place where people were slaughtered. It was just terrible. And then on the steps of Mauthausen, I said, you know, I've got to do something. And the next day, I got my instant reward. I went to the HIAS office, which is the office where uh, people going to the United States were taken care of. And they brought in 35 young kids to meet us. And we were six grubby American kids who had been on the road for 10 weeks. And we looked at <laughs> And I spent about half an hour talking to these two kids going to California from Hungary. And just about to leave, this little girl standing next to him. And I said to her four things, 30 seconds. What's your name? Where you're from? Where you're going? What's your phone number? And her father had always told her, never, ever give your phone number to anybody. But her father had made her go to this thing. And she didn't want to meet these grubby American kids. So despite him, she gave me her phone number in New York put it in my pocket, and by the time I had walked out the door, I had forgotten all about it because I collected this. You know, we, we met all kinds yeah. of people. Two months later, it's a cold day in Philadelphia, and I said, well, I got to go through all the junk I collected this summer, and there's this piece of paper with a name and a phone number. I had no idea who it was, where it was from, but the phone number was New York, and it turned out to be Leah's cousin, and she told me that Leah Ellie Elias was a 19-year-old girl. They were coming to New York sometime around Christmas. And I said, well, we're having a reunion for the group on Christmas Day in New York. She shows up. Have her come. Make a long story short, she showed up and never left. And uh, we've been married 52 and a half years. And um, it's a one in a million story. It could never, ever happen. Uh, I've told this story a few times, more than a few. Um, and even every time I tell it, I just can't believe it ever happened. Because it, it's, what if I throw the piece of paper away? What if I, was it a cold day in Philadelphia? What if she had to come? Whatever. It was just a unique experience. Um, but that also changed my life because I believe that life's been good to me. And so I am in the give back mode. And I've spent my life giving back. Uh, we've been fortunate to be able to do so. We give back in money, but even more important, we give back in time. Um, I've been president of the Beth Israel Synagogue, uh, the Hartford Jewish Federation, the Hebrew Home and Hospital. I've served on 25, 30 boards throughout the community over the last 45 years. And I've gotten a very interesting perspective of the community. But more important than that, we've helped a lot of people. And one of the reasons that Plymouth Spring, that we have such good management is because I didn't want to be a slave to the business every day. I wanted to be able to supervise and run it, but I didn't want to have to do the day-to-day -day every single day. And I was at the point where I knew I could find the right person, and I did. And that's allowed my wife and I to spend a lot of time doing other things um, and helping a lot of people. It's been a great life. That's really uh, just such a terrific, uh, such a terrific story. And I think when you think about all you've been able to do, you know, there's so much talk about work-life balance and you've been on boards, uh, nonprofit boards, for-profit boards, bank directors, your own, your own bank. Um, 
How do you think about, um, and you, we haven't talked about your kids yet. Right. How do you, how do you balance, how do you think about how have you thought about work-life balance? Well, like, like you said, everything's balance. Okay. I mean, we, we spend enough time to be sure we have a successful business and we spend enough time to be sure we have a successful life. <laughs> and do I have a magic formula for it? No, it just happens. Um, I would very bad at saying no. I am uh, very bad at that. I very, very seldom turn down somebody who needs help. So um, I don't have a formula for balance. It just comes. And uh, the busier I get, we still balance. We still do it. <laughs> and we also do a lot of traveling. That's another thing. It's another hobby of ours. We've been to uh, 125 countries, not any in the past year and a half, however. <laughs> but I've been to 125 countries. We have trips booked for the end of the year and next year. And still we'll run the business. And still I'll be involved in all these other activities um, because that's where I want my life to be. How do you? How have you and Leah sort of structured your life together? Like, have you? Do you talk about kind of the 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 different things you do? You know, what does she do? I mean, how have you guys? We have. First of all, we spent the last year and a half together, yeah. constantly. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, we talk about a lot of things. And we know. always we always have, but but the last year and a half has obviously been unique. Yeah. Uh, we work as a team. She's been president of the Jewish Historical Society of Jewish Family Service. She's been involved in fundraising, as have I, for many different activities. Uh, so she doesn't do as much as I do, but she's as committed as I am. And when we make a decision about to help someone, we usually make it together. Mm -hmm. So she feels, she also feels very lucky. I mean, this is a girl who came here with nothing. Uh, very bright girl, I might add. Very intelligent, very smart. Uh, went to UConn. Beautiful too, by the way. Went to UConn, get a sec got a second degree in um, landscape design, graduated, this is really embarrassing for UConn, graduated third in her class of 4,000, okay, and not a native English speaker. Third in her class of shame <laughs> on UConn. Uh, although we do like the basketball team a great deal. I bet. Uh, but um, she did extremely well, and um, she loves this country. And she loves uh, being able to help people. Mm. That's really, uh, it's really tremendous. And, you know, to think that you grew up right here in West Hartford and have basically called West Hartford home for your entire life minus uh, four, four years, years in, in Philadelphia and a few years in Bloomfield. <laughs> if you will, you know, Bloomfield, we'll, we'll kind of round that out <laughs> right. uh, and, and call it and, and call it close enough. Um, you know, before we kind of wrap up, Richard, this has been so tremendous and get to rapid fire round of questions. What do you, what's the future look like? What do you see um, for Plymouth Spring? What do you see for yourself in, in business and manufacturing and in life in general? Well, let's talk about Plymouth Spring first. Plymouth Spring has grown 550%, five and a half times its size in 1990. More important, as I learned when I first got into business and uh, somebody asked me, what's the most important line on your income statement? And I said, the sales line, well, that was a mistake. And he said, no, no, the bottom line, bottom line, our bottom line has grown commensurate with that. So we're very pleased about that. We have the right management team. Uh, I have an outside board of directors, plus my wife and myself and our kids. But we also have four excellent outside directors. And we have a succession plan. Not Our kids are not interested, but we have a succession plan in place. So I think Plymouth Spring will continue on. Uh, our business this year we're going bonkers. Uh, last year, obviously, we had problems during the beginning of the pandemic, but at after the uh, second quarter, business just took off, and today we're at record levels. I, I can't explain it, but we are at record levels right now. Um, as far as my cons, I'm 74. Um, I'm not interested in retiring. I did spend the last year in semi-retirement, so, right, which makes you know you don't want to retire. I don't want to retire. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to continue to balance work and doing things and traveling and all the other things that we want to do with our lives. So we'll continue on the same path. 
it's really terrific. And I'm just so happy to um, have had, you know, have had the opportunity to get you on here and, and get the story. Happy to have been here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be able to check up in a couple more years and see where we are at that point. Are you ready for rapid fire? Sure. All right, Richard, Red Sox or Yankees? Yankees. Oh, man, this was going so well. Starbucks <laughs> or Duncan? Yeah, well, Duncan most of the time, but occasionally we we give in to Starbucks. <laughs> A staycation or exotic destination? Oh, that's easy. Exotic destination. Uh, Lots I, of them. But yeah, I bet. <laughs> iPhone or Android? We're an Apple person all the way. There you go. Sports car or SUV? Actually, I like sedans better than both of them. I have <laughs> a, uh, a Lexus 350. I kind of like that. There you go. So if you call that a sports car, it's a sports car, but it's more like a sedan. Sedan. Do you have a favorite business book? Yeah, uh, I just finished reading um, a book. Uh, I can't remember the name of the book, but it was got a, one of his guys who started ESPN, mm. uh, George Brockenheimer, I believe his name is. And uh, he talks about how they started with, uh, what did he say, the uh, their savings account and $256 million from uh, Pennzoil. <laughs> so uh, it's a very interesting book. I also, of course, Startup Nation is a great book, great book. about the Israeli entrepreneurs. That's a great, those are two great ones. If you had to do something, Richard, other than run Plymouth Spring, what would you do? I'd be a movie director. Really? Or actually a movie producer. Really? Yeah, I'm a, uh, I'm a movie fan. I, uh, I have, I'm embarrassed to say this, I have about 8,000 movies. Um, but I tend toward classics, you know, like uh, Gone with the Wind and Casablanca. Sure. I have a friend, a very dear friend, who never would watch a movie with us. It was in black and white. I used to say, some of the best ones are actually in black and white. He said, no, no. If it's not in black, if it's not in color, I won't watch it. What can you do? Yeah, what can you do? But, but um, I'm a classic movie collector. I love them. Oh, that's great. Well, here's looking at you, kids. Um, exactly. <laughs> what's one thing, Richard, that you learned early in your life or early in your career that you think has helped propel you to all the great success that you've had? I think I learned to value the opinions of others, which is always important, and to know where it's coming from, mm -hmm. which is equally as important. As I always say, free advice is worth exactly what you pay for it, but sometimes it's worth more, mm -hmm. depending on the source. Um, and I've also learned, as we talked earlier, about balance. Mm. That's that's been very important to be able to have a balance in my life. I oh, was no question about that. Um, and what's something that you learned later in your life or later in your career that if you could go back and tell young Richard, and if he'd listened to you, that you think would make a real positive impact on him? I learned that there's more in life than just slaving in a business. I didn't know that at the very beginning, uh, even though it was a goal. I spent lots of time, but I learned that there's more to life than just doing business, that you really try to set your mark in life. Mm -hmm. And that's something it took me some time to learn. It was a goal, but I didn't learn it until midlife. That is a, that is a wonderful, uh, wonderful lesson. Would it be that all young people could uh, learn that uh, sooner than later? Richard, it has been an absolute pleasure uh, having you on. There's so much gold uh, in this episode. I'm so excited to share it with the audience. It's been a pleasure to be here. Made in America with Ari Santiago is brought to you by IT Direct. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and spending some time with me today. You know, my goal is to help build a community where we can learn and grow together. Your input, feedback, and engagement is critical to making that happen. Please do comment, like, and subscribe so more and more people can hear what we're doing and join our community of growth and success. Thanks so much for tuning in. Talk to you again soon.